Okay, thanks guys for having us here. Uh, today, this, me, myself, Bhaskar and Vivek, we're going to talk about a methodology that uh, helps us design delightful products. What you're going to hear today is something very different from what you've been hearing so far. It's not, you won't see any code, I promise you that. But it'll, it'll, be, a little, it'll be hopefully help you think about products in, in a different way. And, and when, you go guys, when you guys go back and, and think about products in your organizations, you'll be able to probably do it better. That's our hope. Uh, two more things, the way we have structured this talk is, uh, I will kind of start off this talk talking about the principles. And Vivek will actually talk through a real life application of how we apply those principles in an everyday product that we work with. Uh, and how that really changed uh, the game for the product that he, he runs. The second thing is that we have a booth outside uh, where we have some really uh, top-notch designers, Sanjay and Santosh. So if you find some of any of this interesting, please go out and talk to those guys and you'll get a lot more uh, uh, insights into what we do uh, at Intuit. So uh, let's start talking about what's the last app product that you used that really delighted you, okay? And I'll, I'll show a couple of things here and I'll, I'll ask questions as to, you know, do you remember any of these? Can anyone tell me what the first one is? Sorry? Wave, yeah, some of you do remember it. But, uh, you know, amongst a whole slew of products that Google introduced, it somehow got lost. And another one is Microsoft Zune. It, it actually was a leader at the time that it came out. But again, it, it's kind of lost uh, it, it's, it's, its path. So what, why do we love some products? What do we love about those products? And there are other products that we don't even remember. And, and we feel that you know, what we really love are awesome products. And what is awesome? What is awesome is that it, beyond just the feature function of you know, me, me, meeting the requirements of that user, it actually connects with you in a way that it, it touches you in a way where it, it, it makes you feel delighted by the experience of using that product. So that's really what we want to talk about, design for delight. You know, what, what that is, is it goes beyond customer expectations and delivers ease and delight. And again, I'll just kind of talk about, you know, what does that get you? So you guys, a lot of you work in startups. If you were to achieve something like this beyond the fact that you're truly serving your customers really well. What else does that get you? Any, 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 any ideas about that? Okay, uh, you know what, what I think it really gets us and what, how it has helped us is that the user who's using that product actually goes out and talks to other guys and says, you know, this is really amazing that I had an amazing experience working with this product and therefore, why don't you use it? You know, it, 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 it gets that word of mouth going and you don't have to spend a lot of marketing dollars getting your product to, to have traction in, in the market. So that's really why we go about doing this particular approach. And there are three pillars of this approach. The first pillar, which is the most important pillar, is customer empathy. So we, 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 and I'll talk about some of the things that we do to get that. Uh, then in terms of our ideation for the, pro for the product, we go, we go about going broad, then going narrow. And the third thing we do, which a lot of you already are very well aware of, is going lean, is iterative experiments to understand what really works, right? So I'll quickly talk about these three concepts and then I'll hand it over to Vivek to talk about how we've done it in one of our products. So what is customer empathy? So Scott Cook, who, who's our founder, he says, it's knowing the customers better than they know themselves. And there are some examples that we'll talk about which, which kind of talk about how do you get there, right? So the most important thing about knowing customers well is talking to them, right? Is, is actually getting in front of customers, not just building products on your own, but before you actually build products, you actually go to your customers and talk to them to understand how they do their things. But there's a, there's a method to how you go about talking to them, right? So when we go and talk to our customers, it's really important that we have open-ended questions. So, you know, for instance, did you like your high school? Now that's a question that something like that would typically give you a very simple answer. Yes, no, I like this, I like that. But if you have an open-ended questions like, what was your high school experience like? Did you buy flight tickets online? How did you go about buying your flight tickets? How did you go about making those decisions, right? So typically questions which are starting with have is would. You change that conversation to have conversations like why, what, 
How did you go about doing it? And the reason that helps you is that sometimes you go with a blinders on. You have a certain specific thing that you're looking for, but having open-ended questions gives you a much wider perspective and makes you think about things you haven't thought about earlier. Right? Also, it's very important to have those conversations in a casual manner. So when we do have those conversations, the first thing that we try to do is to break the ice with, with the customer. It's not, it's not easy talking, just talk, going into a shop and talking to a customer. And therefore, it's important to find ways where you break the ice. And it's also important to have the script in your head. You should not kind of have a very detailed script where you kind of go through a set of questions like a survey. It's important to have it in your head. You should have an overall framework in mind while you're having those conversations so that it helps you discover certain things. I'll give you an example of how we did that in, in, in the near future. But one more important thing that you should understand is that as you're having those conversations, it's important to capture emotions. What's really important in terms of customer empathy is to understand what are the pain points. So if you feel that there's something that the customer is doing which is causing frustration, when you go back to user, user experience design, it's important to remember that and therefore, because that's what you need to address. If something is causing real happiness or something that he's really loving it, it's important to capture that because those are the most important things that you need to iterate on as you go through your experience design. So I'll give you another example where once we kind of talk to customers, we also want to observe them in their place of work. Okay? So I'll give you an example here wherein once we went to, to our customer and we wanted to talk to him about how he manages his bills, right? And we had it in our mind that you know mostly they must be managing their bills by due date, right? But we wanted to see exactly how they do it, and we went and say showed he, she showed us an accordion folder wherein the bills that were due in two, two weeks were right up front, but bills which are past due date were behind. And that was sort of a cognitive dissonance for us. It kind of went against our thought. And when we discovered this, we understood that there was a different way the customer was thinking in our mind. Because the credit card bills, which had higher interest rates, were right up front. And the bills that were not that important, with not such a negative impact, were behind. And therefore, it completely helped us change our user experience design to address that aspect of the customer's thinking, right? So what I'm trying to get at is uh, important talk to talk to the customer, but important to observe the customer and understand where he, she's coming from. So uh, quickly, I'll just do a recap. It's about identifying the real pain point in context of, to cus of the customer, talking to customers, having open-ended conversations, and observing the customer. The next part about once you've had the customer conversation is to actually go broad with your ideas about how you'll address those customer pain points. Uh, the, the important thing up here is to kind of think quantity first. Again, the idea here is uh, to not have something specific that you're working on, but first find with your team, come up with a broad set of ideas and, and actually figure out which one have most traction. And, and that, what, what that helps here, so what, I'll give you an example here what we did. We had a product called Fussel, uh, wherein uh, we had some ideas about helping farmers imp uh, get, get uh, market information and improve their incomes. And when we did that, we actually had a mobile product here. We actually went through multiple ideas about how we can ex interact with that farmer in terms of uh, getting them price information, in terms of getting them location information, in terms of getting them what product they want to sell. And each of those ideas is something that we iterated with which is the next item that you want to talk about. So once you have some of these ideas, you kind of build hypotheses about what are your main hypotheses about how the customer will interact and where your ideas might fail. And you, this is something that's very common to most of, of you who have worked in startups, is to go lean, right? You actually iterate, build FACO backends if you have to, figure out customer behavior based on those lean experiments, and understand your product direction based on those lean experiments. So that, in a nutshell, is, is how we go about designing for Delight, having customer experiments, going broad to go narrow, and then actually iterating really rapidly about what works with that customer based on real experiments that we run. And, and that's when how we kind of drive the product direction. At this point in time, I'll just pass it on to Awake, who will actually talk through a real-life uh, real scenario in, in some, a, a very, a very, a product that you would not expect to, to actually drive delight with. And, and we'll talk about how he, we went about doing it.
full. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay. So it's great, you know, we're designing products that people love and delight. Now if you're building the next iPhone, you're building the next e-commerce site, people love that stuff, right? People want to buy more stuff, people want to sort of enjoy their new iPhone, their new whatever device it is. But then what we do at Intuit is we take the most boring thing that people do, file their taxes, accounting, and try and build delight around it. So let me actually, I'm just gonna, I was just thinking about this. I'm gonna give you a little example, and this is the way kind of we look at ourselves. Gonna take a very today example that we're talking about here in India in terms of net neutrality, and show you how sort of we want to be the John Oliver who sort of shines lights of on things. Net neutrality. Net neutrality. Yes, net neutrality. The only two words that promise more boredom in the English language are featuring sting. And, and hearing, hearing, hearing people talk about it is somehow even worse. As anticipated, the notice proposes to ground the net neutrality rules in Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Oh, oh you guys didn't hear the word any of that? <laughs> Sorry. So basically what John Oliver was saying there is uh, talking about net neutrality is the most boring thing in the world. And yet he was able to shine a light and actually get enough people to go and talk about it and actually get uh, the US Trade Commission to actually pull it back. So we do something even more boring than that. We work with taxes, right? We work with basically the US tax uh, laws and help people file their taxes in the US, which honestly, if you, if you look at sort of our customers and building customer empathy, they have to come back every year. Uh, pretty much for the first half of the year, they sort of heads buried in the sand, don't really care about their taxes, really want to procrastinate until the last minute, and yet we want to build a product that delights them constantly. Uh, we're mostly helping people sort of make sure that they don't tear their heads off. And our end goal is for them to feel this way while they're filing their taxes. So how do we go about doing it? So there are two schools of sort of large thought in product, uh, in sort of the way you design and develop products. One is sort of the Steve Jobs method, right? You have a brilliant person in the room, he figures out everything that the customer wants, goes out, builds it, and designs it. Bam, you have Steve Jobs with the iPhone. The other is kind of the more boring rinse and repeat process that we follow at Intuit. Essentially, awesome takes practice. So we want to build delight in a product that customers would rather not use, procrastinate, and quite often sort of dread the final outcome, right? End of the day, you're either paying taxes or you're owing taxes. And just, just sort of setting context, this is the tax product we build is fundamentally for the US market. So the other challenge we have here in Intuit India is we're really far away from that customer. Yet we have to devise mechanisms to build customer empathy, to understand sort of how the customers use the product and sort of connect with the customers in many ways that sort of is really hard to do. So we, we sort of follow these capabilities around D4D that Bhaskar just laid out to try and sort of push the envelope on all of these things a lot more. So fundamentally, uh, US taxes are ridiculously complicated. There's a whole bunch of papers that you get a W-2 form, a bunch of 1099 forms, forms from your um, banks, forms from your investments, forms from your healthcare providers. And throughout sort of the year, right around tax season, you need to collate, organize this, enter this data somehow, and your sort of two main options are either you do it yourself or you go to a CPA. And we sort of work fundamentally in the do-it-yourself market where we help people file the taxes themselves. Uh, I get a little bit of background. We've been around 30 years now. Um, our tax product on desktop and web have been around sort of 15, 20 years. But mobile was something new, and we said, hey, in five years ago, sort of right around when the um, iPhone 3 and iPhone 3GS came out, 
we said, hey, we need to figure out, you know, there's a whole bunch of people using this new sort of mobile technology, and what can we do to take advantage of that, and how can we serve customers of this new channel, right? And, and sort of the first question we asked ourselves is, why? Why on mobile? Would some people want to do taxes on, on mobile, really? Why? So we actually went out and followed uh, sort of a lot of our D4D methods and went out and just spoke to customers. We spoke to our existing customers. We spoke to uh, new customers. We spoke to customers who use us on the web, on a variety of different places. We followed people around. So I think there are three sort of major ways that we, and we, and we find this really useful is the, how we learn from our customers. We, um, we actually have a very large research organization in the US. Um, and if you're building products for the US, uh, it helps to work with sort of somebody who does this research either on a contract basis or you have sort of feet in the ground there, who actually go in and talk to people, who observe how they use your product, who observe how they use different products. And you're not so much looking for exactly what they're doing on the product, but focusing more on sort of their sentiments, how they're feeling, what they're sort of talking to you about as they're going through the product. Uh, another interesting mechanism we use is this concept called follow me homes, where we'll actually follow customers home and sit with them for an hour or two while they're actually working on their taxes. Uh, pretty much all of us at Intuit do it, and I think we sort of put ourselves in the customer's shoes, which is very important because quite often when you actually building, designing, working on a product, you end up not really uh, looking at it from every customer's perspective. You sort of have your blinders on and you're like, you know, this is kind of my happy part and this is what I'm going to design. So with these follow me homes, we actually learn about all these sort of corner cases that customers use our products for, how they organize their documents, how um, they organize sort of the way they go through their uh, tax filing process. We find some people who, who scan every document and store it in their computer as it comes in. We sign, find some people who will just put it in a big shoebox and not worry about it later. We'll find people who get all their documents together April 14th night, which was the day before yesterday, and to file on the April 15th deadline. So we learn sort of all these interesting things about the customer and the sort of emotions they associate with actually filing their taxes. And then, what we, what we did uh, from sort of going after this mobile product using some of these mechanisms, it said, okay, we've learned all these things about our customer, and, and we learn things about them which not necessarily involve our product. So again, you sort of have to roll your mind back to um, when the iPhone 3, 3G was launched. Um, and, you know, sort of smartphones were still reasonably new. Um, so we spent a lot of time just observing how people use these new devices. What, um, they take photos with them, they use sort of maps and locations a fair amount. Uh, data entry was still kind of clunky, a lot of the keyboard entry, like swipe and things were not available, so it made sort of data entry a little challenging. Um, the phones were slow, uh, you know, they had limited battery life, and we'd, we'd just follow users around and see how they use these devices and then try and sort of extract learnings from that into what we would build into our product. So at that point, we said, okay, we, we know that this phone is out, we know people are slowly starting to use smartphones, and we've learned these things about our customers who use the camera a fair amount, who don't really like using the keyboard too much, um, care about battery, uh, like to use their phone on the go, and receive these documents throughout the year and sort of don't really have an organization basis on them. So we actually go through an entire mapping session of what are all the various things we can do, right? And this is kind of this open-end, go broad to go narrow strategy that we do. So we put sort of, you know, have these big boards, we put ideas on the wall saying, um, can we help them sort of do taxes while they're driving? Can we automatically get data from the car so that they can sort of deduct some of those ex expenses? Can we have them snap pictures of their receipts when they buy things, and that gets automatically imported? So we basically go really broad, and then say, okay, once we've sort of narrowed down from this really broad mechanism, we use sort of these mechanisms called two by two matrices, where um, on each one of these axes, you basically put 
the, the key drivers you want for some of these features. Uh, so for instance, uh, the y-axis could be customer delight, and the x-axis could be um, you know, time saved for the customer, something like that. And we try to sort of pick stuff in the top right-hand quadrant that actually has positive impacts on both these axes, and then try and move forward with them. So what do we did do in our mobile story? We actually went really narrow after sort of figuring out all these things that we can do on mobile and said, look, the key thing that we can solve with mobile is actually capture somebody's W-2 form. So most, uh, most everybody who has a job gets a W-2 form which lays out sort of what their income is, how much federal tax is already being deducted, and all those sort of things. And the key capability is sort of build around that OCR capability that's present um, in the actual device. And so then we said, hey, you know, we've narrowed down something that delights the customers because they hate organizing their forms and takes maximum advantage of the camera and the portability and the capabilities of the device itself. So we experimented with a very simple use case. Um, snap a photo of your W-2 and file your taxes. Easy. Um, you know, did, it served a very small slice of customers. Um, basically, people who were W-2 focused and who had only a little uh, of not very complicated taxes. Uh, we, of course, sort of put a whole bunch of analytics in the product itself, try to understand behavior, try to understand flows within it. And, you know, uh, the, the way sort of our products, at least online, work is we have a free product out there, and then um, there's sort of a conversion funnel where people actually convert to uh, ultimately buy the product. So we had 1.2 million downloads, of which only we had a 13% conversion. So a lot of people checked us out. Um, but ultimately didn't use us to file their taxes. Only about 30% did. So we sort of went back to the drawing board and said, hey, what, what are some of the challenges that we were not able to address with sort of this very narrow approach that we'd built um, with this product that we'd call SnapTax? Uh, interestingly enough, sort of as a side anecdote, um, we experimented with this in the India market too last year. Uh, we built sort of a very small, uh, similar to SnapTax, where you basically take a picture of your Form 16, and we generate sort of all the information that's needed um, to file to the tax authorities here. It was called Tax OK, Please. Uh, we launched, uh, we did sort of an MVP last year with the product, uh, got sort of reasonable traction um, in the employee base. Uh, but a couple of things we also learned from that. So again, sort of keeping with this philosophy of rapid expect experimentation and learning, is we actually learned that uh, the slice of population in India that focuses on filing their taxes, uh, the employee slice, is actually uh, not that, there are not that many problems in that market because your employer fundamentally generates all the paperwork that you need. And the key sort of demographic and the key customer sort of pains to solve is actually in the SMB space, uh, which involves sort of filing VAT and service tax and those sort of things. So we're actually experimenting with some of those ideas again in the India market right now. So snap tax, simple, take a picture of your W-2, uh, reasonable impact. So we said, how about we bring sort of our full end-to-end -end capability and shove it on an iPad? So, this, we took our entire desktop experience and said, let's experiment. Let's go really broad and get this out on an iPad and have everybody use it. I mean, obviously, uh, since we did this really quickly, challenges with this approach where the UI was just awful um, and was focused only on one device. And we didn't have the ability to sort of go across device. So we saw a little better conversion. So 225K users filed using our iPad app. So which was up from the 150 um, that we saw on the iPhone, but it still wasn't great. So we said, okay, maybe we should experiment on the mobile web. So we went to the mobile web. Um, I'd, I mean, the fundamental problem we had with the mobile web, given that it was such a complicated product, was we were unable to build sort of that really delightful experience that went across all devices. I mean, obviously, sort of one of the uh, key sort of challenges here is to actually fix that, and, and I know you guys collectively are talking about that here. But 
uh, I'd, we'd love to sort of embrace some of the learnings um, out of this specific conference to see how we can actually embrace the mobile web back again. But uh, we had, we were so reliant on sort of native capabilities on the actual device that the mobile web didn't really move the uh, needle too much for us. So we said, hey, you know, let's, let's sort of rethink this whole thing, take a step back, and build a full-fledged across-device mobile experience. Uh, launched this in sort of December of last year. Uh, we've, we've been learning constantly along the way. Uh, 1.5 plus million downloads. Uh, you know, 50% of the people who download actually file. So, so we know that we're doing something right. Um, and, and we actually know exactly what we're doing right because we're constantly sort of tracking data and experimenting with these customers. Uh, and the interesting thing that we learned was with complex taxes, people actually start on mobile, try to do a lot of the paperwork entry on the mobile device by taking pictures, but ultimately sort of transition to the web and finish their taxes over there. So we actually were able to launch a true sort of start anywhere, finish anywhere experience uh, for our customers. So, but sort of what were, based on some of these D4D principles, based on us sort of diving, diving deeper into our customer base, what were some of these things that we learned, um, either through our research and all of these things, right? So our customers, while they use the product a certain way and respond to our survey results in a certain way, there's some of the key things that they told us were, you know, you guys, I use you guys year after year, and I use your product repeatedly during the tax year. So show me that you know, that you know me, right? So if I log in, show me that you know my tax situation. You don't make me jump through all these hoops every time I'm here. And evoke sort of a positive reaction in the product. Uh, one of the challenges, as I sort of talked about earlier, with a tax product is people don't really like using it. And there are negative asso emotions associated with it. So to build sort of that habit loop to, for people to come back with a tax product, uh, find out sort of what are the things that delight them about it, right? And interestingly enough, what we found out um, that delight people about the product, and I think this is what's important on sort of any products that you build, mm -hmm. is find those things that um, actually drive your user back, that delight them. Uh, for the tax product specifically, it was not really something we controlled, was actually the size of the return they were going to get from the IRS. So it was nothing we did in the product, but our key learning was, hey, let's sort of put that up front and center so they know the moment they start entering data, that number keeps changing. You're going to get $2,000 back. You're going to get $800 back. You're going to get $50 back. As that number keeps changing, they're able to sort of relate to the fact that, oh, as I enter more data, I'm either going to get more money back, or as I sort of scan in more data, I'm going to sort of get more money back, or more, I have to pay more money. And they, they have this kind of... it's. It's sort of this gamified uh, reaction to that where they're constantly sort of focused on that one number and it going up and down and trying to optimize it on sort of what they can do to make it go up and down. Uh, I'm just going to sort of walk you through a few interesting things that, we, uh, that uh, we did in the product. I mean, I guess sort of key learnings uh, that we did is we basically continuously, constantly anal analyze all the data we have in the product. We A-B test and experiment constantly. Uh, and we learned that two major pieces where customers abandon our product, where if anything happens around the W-2 import flow. So we focused sort of so much of our efforts in mobile around the W-2 import flow. And um, the other piece was the key delight, uh, like I mentioned, was the size of their refund always. So if you launch sort of a TurboTax um, Android product, you'll see sort of our core experience is built around that better W2 flow. So it's as soon as you come in, we're talking about how you should do something with your W2, what you should actually do with the physical paper so you have a better chance of success. And, and we do things on the actual camera page to make sure that we drive sort of the right OCR capabilities by making sure there's, you know, we can drive user behavior. So if there's poor light or if it's tilted in a certain way, um, we sort of make sure that the users 
orient their devices correctly so they can actually get the data into the system. And then ultimately focused on right bang up there what your refund is. So uh, those are sort of uh, learnings from how we apply D4D in sort of the mobile context evolved from our essential iPhone 3 world to where we are today with a full-fledged end-to-end mobile product. Uh, we left about ten, 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 minutes. 10 minutes or so for questions. So um, you know, if you guys have any questions either on things that we do in mobile or in other places or D4D in general, happy to take them. Uh, hi, I'm Abhijit here. So I saw like uh, uh, after gathering that, uh, after uh, you decided like what are the tasks they're going to complete or some, some people you decided and that car shorting, I think that procedure on the wall you mentioned, right? Uh -huh. So uh, is there any tool to do those kind of uh, car shorting and or uh, doing uh, to prioritize the tasks or uh, to decide the frequency of use, all these things? Yeah, so the great question. So. Uh, we do, so one of the tools that he did mention was when we go broad to, broad to go narrow, we kind of identify the most important drivers that will help drive customer delight. And we put those on two by twos to understand, uh, you know, what are the most ones that are impactful. But having said that, we actually have other tools as well to actually go through the entire D4D process, something called the next tool. I would uh, encourage you to come and talk to Santosh and Sanjay, who will kind of talk a little more details about that particular tool and how it works. Uh, something that we can perhaps take offline. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, most of us are from startups, and uh, some of the products we design are uh, we we tend to go towards you know building minimal uh, viable product. Mm -hmm. So we don't get enough time to get customer experience. So how do you suggest for, I mean, uh, getting the customer uh, experience? Is it, is it iteration-wise, or do we start it at the first stage? Okay. okay. So uh, yeah, uh, building, min the whole concept of lean is to build minimum viable, right? So, uh, and if you're trying to do that, you're doing absolutely the right thing. But the drivers to get there are to do lean experimentation. and. When we talk about lean experiment, like the example I showed you about the, the app where we were working with farmers, we never really had a product to begin with. You know, we actually had somebody who was getting the customer information behind the scenes and sending SMSs to these guys. It was completely manual. But the point is that to know what works, it's important to kind of understand, go through that lean experimentation. And once you know that there's something that the customers are actually liking and working with based on engagement, that's where that that drives what will be MVP. That's just what our standard process is for lean. We don't build product first. We kind of try to build the experience first and, and then understand what works. Did I answer your question? So uh, what could be the better uh, way to you know, capture customer experience first? Uh, you know, how can we improve the timeline search? So I just want to know that. Yeah, I, I think there are tools available. And again, I think you should talk to the, our experienced designers here offline. Okay. But there are tools available, even in mobile, wherein you can actually fake an experience, where it actually works with, through clicks, etc., to see if people like what they see, right? And once you kind of get to a point where you have something that people are actually engaging with, they're perhaps giving you your email ID to say, when this product becomes much more mature, work with me. When you get to that point where they're giving you currency for a, a, a prototype that you've built, that's where we actually start building product, not before that. And, and, and that's how you kind of speed up your build, build cycle. Uh, that's what we've seen in the past. Uh, hi. Actually, uh, uh, so uh, in uh, the current application, your demo, you show the demo. There we found like the uh, the utility is like kind of uh, the functionality part. Like suppose uh, when I'm logging to the application, I what I, uh, what I need, I'm getting those kind of informations, and it's satisfying my needs. But what about other experience like uh, uh, like uh, the emotional impact, like what you uh, talked in the first time? Like uh, uh, it's not only we are just giving a solution, but we are just touching his. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, huge emotions or something like that, the first uh, slide. Uh, 
So uh, what are the uh, things we should take care in application just to give that kind of feel? It will not satisfy the on, or just only their requirements, but to give them a feel like they'll just it'll just wow them like uh, it can be branding, it can be interactions, or like what kind of things we should take care. Yeah, so I I think sort of the way we approach this is when we actually sort of go and talk to the customer and learn from a few customers, we're actually focused on three or four things that quote unquote delight them, right? So it while the the W two experience in our app was core key and critical for the actual functioning of the app, the thing that actually delighted the customer was the size of their refund. And we learned that only through sort of multiple conversations with people, and it's people don't explicitly say this, but when we go out and talk to people and, and we ask them, you know, what what worries you when you're doing your taxes? Or why do you, you know, why do you procrastinate doing your taxes? A lot of their conversations revolve around, oh, I'm afraid of how much money I'd have to pay the IRS. I'm not sure how much of a return I'm going to get. Um, I'm I don't I don't have the money in the bank right now to pay that five thousand dollars, so I'm going to put it off till later. So, what you sort of get, the underlying sort of um, customer emotions you get from that is the fact that you're able to then sort of put your finger on they actually care about that one specific number, and while you do everything else right, if you don't show them that number up front, um, you know they're not going to have a positive sort of. Based on your product. That information what we are showing on the application, I'm uh, uh, very happy with that. Like suppose user, I want as a user, I want to know like how much tax I have to pay, or from by what are the process from where I can save my tax. Those kind of information that is intuitive. But I'm the, I just want to know about the other uh, things of uh, user experience. Like suppose it can that uh, color schemes, uh, you know that uh, in, uh, interaction part, or. Uh, some other details, like what are the things we should take care of. And one more thing, in some projects, if it is a very small project, that time you maybe you will not get a chance to, to uh, work, work with the customer. Uh, so uh, that time, uh, because when you have a chance, then only you can get, get that contextual information about what they are doing in the real life or what kind of problems they are facing. So if there is not a scope, then what will be, uh, what, what is the procedure? So we Sanjay, kind of respond to that. So to answer your question, so the way that we uh, look at the product is that it has to be very useful to the user. So whatever things that or whatever solutions that we're providing through the product, it should be usable. So the first thing that we have to have an understanding is about the problem the user is currently going through it. And understanding the emotion that is going through it uh, for which we are providing the solution. So coming to your part about the color and the branding stuff, that definitely builds a lot of trust. So in case of ours, Intuit branding or the Taubo Tax or any products that we have, those brandings definitely comes for 30 years of being present in the market. So definitely that's taken care of, at, 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 that it comes at the second stage. First thing is that whether the product that we are building, is it solving for the pain points or not? What is the one pain point or two pain points that we are trying to address through that solution? We really need to get to that level of details. And definitely, when, if you look at the final product, right, the Tabo Tax, the final screen that he has shared right now, it has got a very polished and uh, premium look. So that's, that's a final stage, but initially we really need to focus on that part. I have one more question. Like, suppose, yep. uh, maybe we have a very targeted audience, uh, sub targeted users. Yep. And uh, so, when you are planning, uh, like uh, suppose you have color branding, you maybe, you, maybe you are following that. If there is no color branding uh, for a particular application, it's a new, it's a new to market, and mm -hmm. the startup is creating a product. That time, uh, like how we'll decide the color schemes all these Suppose sometime we don't have an option to add a uh, different color theme option for a particular project product. Mm -hmm. And suppose what you are creating, maybe other people are happy with that, but suppose stakeholders are not agreeing with that. Uh, uh, then what will be, how you will justify your uh, design? Got it, got it. So the way that I look at it, so the color or the branding is actually justifies or uh, defines the personality of that product. So, so once we understand who are the users that we are catering for, what are the things that we do, 
based on that we need to create that product so product think about an individual how do you personify that individual and that product is stands as an identity which solve for that problem let's say the if you think about the branding of facebook and branding of any uh, what do you say tax or banking solutions right the the personality of these two products are completely different so when it comes to color theory we really need every color has got a personality associated to it let's say if you think about green what are the things that comes to your mind it's about energy it's about eco friendliness when you think about orange it's about uh, dynamism it's about uh, uh, what do you call it uh, innovation so those are the things that yeah. got it yeah thank you hi um so you guys build financial products right at the end of the day it means that a lot of my personal financial data is going to end up in your hands on your servers and things like that um when you spoke to customers has that ever been an issue oh it's an issue all the time right <laughs> um i think certain of our products fundamentally revolve around storing your financial data on the cloud like mint for instance right and if you if you look at sort of again it's all about the customer and the customer segments we're targeting if you look at the turbotax desktop product uh we have a very vehement base who actually doesn't want to be connected anywhere at all so the desktop product is local to the desktop doesn't store any data on the cloud and can work pretty much completely in a disconnected mode the mint product is more to the more internet savvy generation who's um who understands that banks store all their information in the cloud they they understand and embrace the fact that there's data out there in the cloud but that doesn't let us get away from you know security and authentication and encryption so and we a lot of our products those are like front and center and we have to make sure that we we sort of tackle those problems head on as opposed to saying don't worry about it we've got it right um and we're doing interesting things in each of these spheres so um some of the experiments we're actually running is going beyond just passwords and one time passwords and things like that we're doing um we're using biometrics so uh especially with new phones even though you're using a desktop product or a web product we'll have like a companion biometric capability on our devices uh we'll actually encrypt your data using keys that we generate from your biometrics so it's it's having that conversation up front with your customers and making sure it's front and center in the product